All right, hello friends, welcome back. My name is still Dan, same as it was an hour ago when I did my, my last podcast. I'm talking to my camera. Oh. <laughs> yeah, <no. laughs> this is Daily Yacht Adventure number 700, 727, sounds like an airplane, 727. Focusing on the final edit layer. Now, this this broadcast could be extremely helpful especially <laughs> to any of you who have taken one of my live classes or in the future will take one of my live painting classes for some reason this is the stage of the painting that gets short shrift in my live classes that's a reason for that. All of my Dan Nelson's painting techniques are slightly unusual. Not all, most are slightly unusual. Layers of transparent acrylic. Most people that come to my classes have never tried that before. Even if they're acrylic painters, they've never done layers of transparent acrylic, followed by layers of transparent oil and so on and so forth. So. Uh, by the time we finally get to this, what I call the final edit layer, which used to be the final layer, is no longer, but I still call it because that's the best descriptor, is final edit. Um, in a sense, at this point, I'm painting like a traditional oil painter, so I don't feel terribly compelled to teach this layer in depth, although experience has taught me that that's probably a wrong impulse on my part because it's at this point that most of my students blow it <laughs> all right so i'm going to spend as long as it takes here today to try to communicate describe convey define what it is about this layer okay now Let me talk about this particular painting just for a minute. Because I just did a bunch of scumbling in my last broadcast, 20 minutes ago, I have an awful lot of opaque paint on this canvas, which does not make me happy. <laughs> well, opaque and translucent, to be more precise, translucent. Um, so I know very well, I know good and well, that this painting is going to undergo, after, like tomorrow or whenever, it's going to undergo another phase of glazing okay so I just want to say don't absorb if you're again if you're following my style don't absorb deep into your soul the look of this painting right now because it's entirely too opaque for my taste but in the back of my mind I'm going no big deal we're gonna glaze it again and then go from there so it will be okay but it's not okay right now be that as it may I'm I, I have no trouble a modeling for you here the again what I call the final edit layer which is also used to be called by me uh, light opaque highlight so again almost everything that we're putting on the canvas no everything that we're putting on the canvas in this layer is lighter than what's already here if it's very light we're gonna put something lighter on top of that if it's very dark we're gonna put something slightly less dark in other words lighter on top of the dark areas does that make sense everything in this layer is slightly lighter than what's already there and I, I call it opaque layers even though technically speaking much of what I do in this layer is actually translucent all right where to get started I want to I want to pick a fairly small zone and I hope that when I leave this small zone, oh, hang on, bear with me, hang on, I just, I did a, I did a um, hard reset. Okay, we're, we're okay, I did a, I did a factory reset on my camera just a little while ago. So let's pick, let's pick this uh, pinkish trapezoid. Let me show you. <laughs> Hang on. 
Let me show you the photograph. So here's the trapezoid of which I speak. It's a brick building. It's this building right here that we see over the top of this one. Got it? But in the photo, in reality, there's a big bunch of foliage right here that blocks it, and I've removed much of that foliage in this painting, and it will it will remain removed. I will, I want some foliage, but not nearly that much. All right, so let's zoom in again to this trapezoid, and uh, I'm going to mix now on my palette, which I'm not bothering to show you, some red, some titanium white. Again, my titanium white is almost always uh, alkyd titanium, fast dry titanium. It's the only alkyd that I have in my normal painting kit. So I've got a kind of a, not a nice pretty bubblegum pink, but a little bit of a dirty, dirty pink. It has to be, I'm gonna add some yellow to that. As a matter of fact, I don't even need to make my first mark before I see it's too, it needs more yellow. All right, we, we zoomed in, my shoulder's not in your way, I hope. Yep. Okay. Let's talk about what happens in this layer. Now that's almost too bright, but um, I'm going to say it's acceptable. Now, first thing you'll notice, that there's a a completely abstract random pencil line. Do you see that? It was that was that's not a, a branch because branches don't look like that although our eye might turn it into a branch because it's up here where there are a bunch of branches around it. But really, it's just an abstract mark. And, this, and here's another one down here. And I'm painting, at the moment at least, in another one. Two, two abstract pencil lines. One goes this way, one goes that way. Do you see that? And they cross. I make an X right there. And I painted around the whole bunch of them, the whole lot. So, and this is this, you don't have to do that, but that is, that is about as characteristic, I, ju I just know this from experience, that is about as characteristic a Dan Nelson mark as, as you will ever see. Now, whether I'll be st still doing such things in 10 years, nobody knows, but at the moment, I think it looks cool, so Now, some of you who are, forgive me, but I will say some of you who are perhaps stuck in the first half of your art journey, first half of your art journey, you learn to paint stuff that looks like stuff. Second half of your art journey, you learn to paint stuff that looks like paint. So why is this mark there? Because it looks like paint. Because it looks like pure abstraction. It does not look like the side of a building. It does not look like um, a branch. It just looks like a purely abstract mark. Why is it there then? And the answer is because it looks cool. That's, that's the essence of abstract realism, which is what I call my style of painting. You can call yours that if you want to. I did not make it up. I got it from David LeFell. I think that's L-E-F-E-L. -E big, big dog painter, big dog, big dog, famous painter, <laughs> David LeFell. <laughs> I paint them all with the same wide brush. Big dog. <laughs> all right. Now, I could have said a whole lot more about what I was doing there, but I didn't because I was too busy yakking about other stuff. So let me clean these brushes. Let's move right along now to the, the sky, the blue bit. So that maybe that trapezoid is done. Hang on, hang on. No, it's not. Hang on. Let, let me let me let me go ahead and do the light on top of it before I leave. Okay, as you know, you regulars know, this is normal practice. You guys are chatting up a storm. <laughs> uh, Susan, you don't glaze over wet, do you? No, no, that's correct. No, it has to be dry before you glaze on top of it. Okay, thank you, Susan. I did it. My head, my head. <laughs> thank you for letting me know. I will indeed move you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You liked my head, though, did you? It's a nice balding head. As heads go. All right, I'm going to do now a slightly lighter version 
of what I just put on the canvas. You regulars, you know the drill. Usually when you make a red color lighter, you have to add more yellow to it at the same time, or it does become that sickly pink color. It doesn't, it, it doesn't strike our mind, I think, as light red. It strikes our mind as a different color, that being pink. And, and if we don't want to convey pinkness, then you better add yellow to it. Then it looks like a lighter version of what's already there. Now, in my last broadcast, many of you were with me just a few minutes ago. In my last broadcast, I did a bunch of scumbling over this whole area of the painting. With that scumble action, I got pretty much this part of the painting up to the lightness that that I want. Okay, so I'm I'm free now to focus on small details, if you will, without worrying that I'm going off track. Bear with me just a minute. I'm going to switch brushes. I want something slightly larger. It was unusual for me to use brushes as small as I was just a minute ago, but let's go back to something quite a bit more normal. All right, now I'm mixing up some phthalo blue and titanium white, tiny bit of green, tiny, tiny bit of green, and my brush is not perfectly clean, so it's a little bit of a a warm, dirty blue, dirty warm blue. I think I'm probably too bright. Yeah, 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 way too much. Let's add some raw umber that to, to kill that, push that color down. Try it now. Oh, there, perfect. All right, what, what makes it perfect? It's just slightly lighter than what's already there, right? You, you don't want to do slightly darker. That is mud. All right, I'm going to stop here in just a minute, and we're going to do a, a little, a little class, a little bit of, let's <laughs> say demagoguery, no, a little bit of <laughs> didacticism, <laughs> didactagoguery. <laughs> I want to teach uh, here in just a minute. Let me do just empty these brushes out and then, because there's a very important concept that you need to have clear in your mind before you really understand this, this final edit concept. Okay, no, that's really fun to me, but it's a, it, it's a little bit too much of a good thing. So I'm going to drag my brush across some of those abstract marks that I just created. Just just push it back, if you will, just a little, bit, a little bit too much energy there, visual energy. All right, put these brushes down. Thank you, Susan, for answering questions for me. Hey, let me, let me take advantage of this chair here. By the way, here's the view off to my left. Oh, here's the view. It's Kelsey, daughter <laughs> like Kelsey, doing her toenails. Sorry, Kelsey. That was not that was not part of the plan. <laughs> Don't worry. My my friends are all very friendly. They'll all be saying, "Hi, Kelsey. Hi, Kelsey. Hi, Kelsey. Hi, Kelsey. Ooh, she's pretty." That's what they'll be saying. <laughs> all right. Uh, all right. I have just I'm a piece of a pad of paper here. I'm not going to waste a pad of paper. I'm going to draw on the back. I'm going to be a little bit esoteric here for you for a minute. I have here a nice fat ebony pencil. Okay. And I have just drawn what most people would call a line. Right? Now forgive me here. Before I go any further. <laughs> <laughs> part of my brain, part of my mind inside is when is going. Okay, I have this expression from Peanuts, Charlie Brown cartoon, Lucy Van Pelt, Charlie Brown's antagonist, primary antagonist. Um, used to have this thing. This goes back to my teenage years, I'm sure. Where I don't know if she did it inside a booth. I don't think so. <laughs> like psychiatrist is in, but 
every once in a while, Lucy would go off in uh, what she called little known facts of science. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, <laughs> it, it was all crazy. It was none of it was true. But she would go off in long, long, flowery speeches about some little known. F you can't see my head, can you? Some little known fact of science that was not true. I personally, I call that Van Peltism because her name was Lucy Van Pelt. So, Van Peltism is when somebody waxes eloquent on something really stupid. And very often, it's something that everybody knows, just the person who's waxing eloquent doesn't realize that everybody already knows it. So I'm in grave danger right here of launching into a, a, a season of Van Peltism. <laughs> Hang on, let me, let me fix, my, fix my camera just a little bit so my head's not cut off. All right. <laughs> With that said, just a few minutes ago, I drew what most people would call a line. But if you're an artist, you need to recognize that this is not a line. I did a big fat one on purpose, so it'll be real obvious, okay? That is not a line. It's two lines. That is not one line. That's two lines, right? Let me get up, up close. There's one line on this side where the brown of the cardboard shifts to the gray-black of the of the uh, graphite. And then there's a separate and distinct separate number two line on this side where the graphite transitions to the brown cardboard. This, there are here, I just drew two lines. One here and two, one there. That's two lines. Now, of course, we can get really crazy analytical and say, well, I'm doing the same thing right here. And indeed I am, because it's much smaller, but with a microscope, that, that line would appear huge, right? So it's actually two lines, although our, that challenges the no, normal um, nomenclature. <laughs> this really does look like one line. Let me do that same little exercise one more time, just to, to make the point. Okay, and again, some of you are going, this is so stupid, I've known this since I was four, and others you are, of you are going, oh my God, I never thought about this before. Okay, so my apologies to those of you who've understood this, since, um, yeah, the two transitions equal two lines. Here it is again. How many lines did I just draw? And as an artist, your answer is, hang on, let me put the cat back on that. As an artist, you need to understand that the answer is two. I drew two lines, I created, I didn't draw, created two lines. One is the transition from brown to white, and the other is the transition on this side, from brown to white or from white to brown, either one, two lines. Now, this becomes important. Let's just do one more just to make sure. Here's a highlighter. Can you, oh, you can hardly even see it. Okay, how many lines did I create now? The answer is four six, eight, ten, and so on. You with me? Now you understand. And again, some of you are saying, oh, this is so stupid, I can't believe I'm watching this, because you've known this since you were seven. And others of you are going, oh my God, I never thought about that before. Okay, so what, what does this have to do with painting? It has a lot to do with, especially the final edit layer of painting. I'm trying to decide where, where, where to do this. Um, oh, here, let me, I'm going to change my mind. I'm going to go down here into this, these windows right here. Okay. So these are windows. Again, I'm looking at my photograph. Doesn't help me much. My memory helps me more. Uh, the evening that I was here, this, this, little restaurant almost looked closed because there's no light coming out but in fact it was open all right so let me show you how this inane observation impacts the final edit layer and oh my goodness I hope the right people are watching today <laughs> I'm being facetious I don't know who you are but I, I this is 
this would help so many people. All right, this is a, a window with vertical dividers or mullions. And they, as you can see, they're, they're quite irregular. In fact, this one isn't even supposed to be there. All right, good, Let's, we'll eliminate that one. But these are there. Again, I'm looking my, I'm wrinkling my nose, <laughs> raising my eyes, and looking at my photograph up there. And yes, they, they need to be much narrower than they are. So here's where, here's where that little demonstration be, can, can impact the way you paint. Remember, anytime you paint a line, you're painting two lines. All right, so I want to skinify. I want to thin up, narrow these mullions. So I'm, I'm trying to mix a color that is the same as this or this or this or this or this, the window, not the mullion. And I'm going to skinify. I'm going to narrow, make narrower. I'm still mixing colors over here. Make narrower, right? I, 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 I would like to demonstrate how most Let's, I'm going to start with this one. I would like to demonstrate the wrong way to do this, but in so doing, I would ruin my painting, so I can't. So let me just describe. I've mixed up a color now that is green, dirty green, like that right there. And I want to skinify, make narrower, this mullion, it's called. Most early journey painters would paint up to it and carry their stroke back a good bit. I am not going to do that. Now I just made that marks that that mullion skinnier. I'm assuming you can see this, right? But how many lines did I just paint? Thank you very much. That is correct. How many lines did I just create? I should say more precisely. The answer is two. One on this side, one on this side. Not one line. I created two lines. Every mark that I put down, every single mark that I put down creates a whole, si like in this case, it's a, it's a circle, it's an uh, oval. But I, I, the, the lines are where one color transitions into another. Now, I've already done enough in that particular area. I don't want to do much more. I'm going to pick you guys up. I know this is crazy, but I really wanted to see this up close. Because this is what most people who are trying to do my style and not quite getting it, this is what they miss. Hang on, bear with me for a minute. All right. You can see this little faint secondary line to the left of the big one. Hang on, it's hard for me to hold it still. There's about a three second delay. Do you see it? Now, what is that doing there? What is that little sec? I just created it. And by the way, let's just be clear. How many lines does that dark area, which is the underpainting showing through, it's two lines, right? One on the left and one on the right side of that shape. Are you with me? I'm going to do a bunch more of this, so I don't need to focus on just, just this one. Every stroke that you put down it creates two lines. One on the left, one on the right, one on the top, one on the bottom. Without getting ridiculously analytical, say, well, you create a whole bunch of lines. Yeah, okay, no, 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 yeah, yeah, I know, I know, no, no, this is not, I don't want to get that, that crazy. Let's just, just keep it. Now, let, let's move on to this one. So I'm mixing up another batch. I'm adding yellow, quite a bit of yellow to my color here, because this here is much yellower than this was. Again, I want to skinny up this mullion. Again, I'm going to do it this time. I'm going to ruin the painting. A typical early journey painter would go like this and say, there, I skinified it. I made it skinny. And indeed you did. But you lost an opportunity. You missed an opportunity. Now let's see if I can take that off. You missed an opportunity. I'm going to, I did take it off. So there, playing dangerously. Now let me show you. I'm going to do it. Are we 
pointing in the right direction? Yes, we are. Let me do it. Show you my way now. Generally speaking, that's my default. Why? Because in making this line, how many lines have I made? Two. Now I'm not going to leave it quite that obtuse, obvious, redundant. I'm going to smudge up the second, the 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 right hand side of that line. I hope some of you are getting this. Some of you are saying, "I don't get it." Mm, forgive me. Hang on. All right. So now you can see I've got a little dark spot right there, and a little dark dash right there, and one that's sort of three, and they're a little bit evenly spaced. So, okay, let's let's just mess it up there. <laughs> I have now. On this side of this mullion, I've now let me let me just proceed right to the other side of the mullion without a great deal of hesitation, mixing up and again a darker color, darker green to match what's over here. Same thing. I could probably stop right there. I have, I especially over here I've skinified, I've made this mullion skinnier. In the process of which, though, I've created dark bits and a couple scratches. Over here, uh, some of the underpainting, I didn't paint this area right here. I didn't paint this area right here. So There's a lot of energy, there's a lot of things going on there that you wouldn't get if you just sort of, if you will, got mad at it the way early journey painters do say, that's not supposed to be there, it's supposed to be, that mullion's supposed to be skinny, doggone it, so I'm going to make it skinny. You know, that kind of attitude. I'm exaggerating, of course, I hope I'm exaggerating, to make the point. I'm going to continue painting here. I've mixed up a brown-ish color. It's too brown, let me add some, let me add some, um, some green to that. Hang on, S still mixing. Still mixing colors, trying to get a dirty brown green. This whole dark area right here is not even supposed to be there, so I'm going to obliterate it, so to speak. But watch, I am not obliterating it actually at all. I'm just partially obliterating it. Why? Because I just created a little delightful little Man, constellation of lines. Going back to my pad of paper, one line equals two lines. I just created a whole bunch of that. In fact, it's a little bit too much energy, so don't dismay yet. Finger in rag, there. Okay, so once again, my objective here was to obliterate a, a dark mark that isn't supposed to be there. And I have accomplished that objective, right? Do you, you recognize that? I've, I have indeed successfully obliterated, if to overstate the case, I've successfully obliterated that dark mark. The, in the course of obliterating it, I have not created a boring flat, what I call plastering paint. Now there's a time for plastering, no, but but this is not it. And I've created a fascinating little a, a constellation is a good word of little um, marks. Okay, so at this point I could declare this row of windows right here finished. Whoop, almost, except that there's some on the far side of this flag. So let's, and I'm using evidently the default color in this painting is a dull brownish green. So I'm now some of you might be saying, I don't get it. What does this have to do with the pad of paper and the lines? The, the, the answer is every time I put down a stroke, let's just say stroke like this, I'm creating two lines, one on this edge and one on this edge. And if you're smart, you'll utilize both of those strokes, both sides, both lines of that stroke not just the one side. Um, all right, I'm, I'm, that's probably good enough right there. 
let's since I'm right next door, where do I want to go next? Um, you know what I really want to do? I want to tackle that flag. So let, let's move over a little bit and get this flag fixed. Okay? I'm going to do more of the same. Those of you who are not struggling with this issue of the final edit layer, this will be the most boring broadcast you've ever watched. <laughs> Those of you who are, in fact, struggling with this final edit layer, <clears throat> which is most of you, <laughs> this will be the most helpful broadcast perhaps if you can hang in there with me. Okay, I'm going to keep going and keep examining and keep modeling, demonstrating for you. Okay, so flag. It is a, here, again, here's my, here's my photograph. Hang on just a second. Uh, there's a flag in there now? Yeah. Okay, it's a North Carolina flag. Blue at the top with a NC and a star in the middle and blah, 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 blah. Red, red here and white there. You can already see that. All right, so final edit approach to fixing this flag. I, I really think the, the probably the overarching thing that I would like you to observe in this, in the final edit layer, is no plastering. See, like this area right here, this is theoretically, this corner is supposed to all be blue because the, that's the, but look at I left all this dirty stuff showing through underneath. Why? You can get tired of this after a while because it looks cool. <laughs> because our eyes like it. Because we, and when I say eyes, of course, I mean the seeing part of our brain or the seeing part of our mind likes it, likes looking at it. I've just mixed up a slightly uh, more ultramarine, cooler blue for a minute there. I'm going to leave that that for now. Yeah. Let me clean those brushes really quickly. And let's do the red. Let's do the red section now. So everything, by the way, um, in my painting world, if you want to paint like me, um, everything up to this point, every single thing up to this point, I characterize as underpainting. Everything I've done so far has been underpainting. It's only the final edit layer that becomes what I not what I call overpainting and that's a term most people don't use. I use it because of it's such a strong distinction. I need that I need that term. Okay, red now. Don't plaster. Now some of you might be saying, well, why? Why don't plaster? I don't get it. The, like the color red that, that you're doing right now is so pretty. Why don't you just paint that whole section of flag red? Well, one answer would be boring. That's, I'm done already. <laughs> That's enough of that. I mean, I'm done for this layer. I'll, I'll, everything that I'm doing is going to get another layer of uh, transparent glaze on top of it. Now let's proceed right straight to the... Uh, white section of the of that flag. Now, be, of course, I, I called it white, but it's it's not going to be painted white, right? So I've mixed up a very dirty, warm, dirty, warm white. I'm aware of both sides of every stroke. And I'm leaving, I'm creating more edges than I'm eliminating. That's, oh, there we go. That's a good way to, de to describe what I call good final edit technique. You create more edges than you eliminate. Every stroke is creating at least two edges, right? One on the left, one on the right, or up and down, whichever. whichever. Again, I'm being a little bit simplistic. But. And then if I, if I don't have enough <laughs> at that, then I'll, I'll create a few more just by scratching. Okay, there's an NC. And boy, this is way too small to be legible, so I just a little...
Now, the one I'm doing right now, this is not pleasant painting. Those are not pleasant marks, by the way. All of that is unpleasant marks. Now, it happens that I'm not, pa I'm not panicking <laughs> because I know that I'm going to come back and paint blue. Okay, forgive me. A little detour here away from final edit per se to just general good painting. Um, whenever possible, you, whenever possible, you do not paint things, you paint around things. Traditional early journey painter would paint the blue field and then paint the white lettering on top of the field, right? Correct. That's early journey painter. That's normal standard. 80, 90 percent of the painters that I judge and when I judge a, you know, countywide show or something like that. That's how they paint. Um, but you all know better. Whenever possible, the the white smudges are just there as a setup, as a wind up, as a preparatory for these marks, which is the blue field again, slightly lighter than what I did last time around. Is my shoulder in your way? Hello, Emilka Roca. Roca, uh, no, Roca, right? Roca from Brazil? No, from Portugal. Never mind. Roca. No, 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 <laughs> no Portugal. Ro <laughs> Roca. <laughs> Forgive me. My rudimentary Portuguese. An initial R in Portuguese is Roca. Is like an H, right? Forgive me. I'm blessed messing it up. All right, back to painting. So now I've, I'm painting, again, I'm sort of skinifying, if you want, I'm making thinner and more defined those white marks that were very, uh, that were very messy. There, that works better. Before I leave the flag, let me, let me, let me do a little bit more. Uh, I'm going to start with the white. So I come back, I'm mixing up lighter white than what I used a while ago. Still a, still a warm white, kind of a dirty warm white, but whiter than what was I did before. So there's the red, I mean there's the white, now let's do the red. So this is what I'm doing right now is just my old practice of you put down one color then you mix up a slightly lighter version of it, lighter and brighter usually, and do it on top. So I'm now trying to make up, mix up a lighter and brighter red. <laughs> And it almost doesn't matter where I put these lighter, brighter <laughs> marks. It can just be anywhere, especially on a piece of fabric, which is theoretically blowing in the breeze, right? There we go. Okay, so the flag, that flag might be done. I'm going to leave it for now. Let's go on to this uh, brown rectangle right here, big area. Understand it already has it already has some of the final edit layer done on it. But I'm trying trying to mix up a brown that is close to what's already there. Okay, slightly lighter, never slightly darker. That's mud. Slightly lighter. Okay. Bear with me, I'm still mixing, mixing, mixing. Not too red, not too yellow, not too light, not too dark. That's a little bit light, but I think I can probably live with it. Let me let me look at it. Um, I'm going to darken that just a little bit. I don't need to redo those marks, but I don't want to continue that degree of lightness. 
closer to what's already there. Okay, in the, in the final edit layer, I spend a great deal of time and energy mixing colors to match, this time in an opaque color. What's on my brush is, is theoretically opaque, right? It's actually more often translucent, but for all practical purposes, one would call it opaque. Um, all right, now I wasn't talking about, but do you see that layer area that I painted right there? With the final edit layer, I actually created more edges, not less. And that's where most of my students, I've never said it that way, maybe I need to start saying it that way. That's where most of my students go off the rails in the final edit layer, even if they followed me step by step up to this point. When they get to the final edit layer, they, forgive me, they turn off their brain <laughs> and they start painting the way they know, which is opaquely. And then if, if they in fact do that, then they have the right to walk out of my class at the end of a long day and say, well, I don't know why we did those five hours of underpainting because I ended up covering it all up in the final edit layer. Well, the mistake, of course, you're not supposed to cover it up. So are you perceiving how much of the underpainting is showing through everywhere? And again, it's because every stroke that I put down, I'm aware of two sides of that stroke. I'm creating two lines, not one. In other words, I'm not just focusing on one edge of my brush. I'm aware of what the, in most cases, the heel of my brush is creating a separate line. Like, it's like if I was focusing on this edge, of my, the, the toe of my brush to, to go along there, I'm also aware that I've created a new edge back here and let me show you what a bad painter would do, in my opinion. There, they would go and obliterate that edge that they just made. Now, of course, I can get away with some of that because I know I'm going to come back. In fact, I'll, I just made that edge wider, that, that mark wider. I drove those two edges a little bit far apart. Does that make sense? No plastering. So when I teach live classes, when we come to the final edit layer, one of the rules that I enforce, try to enforce on my students, I try to, I say, if you put down one mark and you put down another mark touching the first mark, you have to leave a gap before your next mark. Does that make sense? Let me say that again. And I, I've been, that's pretty much what I've been doing the whole time I've been painting here in this broadcast. If I put down one mark and another mark that touches the first one, then I leave a gap. See this gap right there? Whew. What are people saying? <laughs> They're all just talking to each other. <laughs> They're all old friends now having gathered at my broadcast many times. Um, okay, quick, let me, slight detour. Um, while I'm detouring, let me, let me mix up a new color. I'm gonna move over to this area. So I need dark green now. Dark, dirty brown green. Dirty brown green. That's a good, good description, don't you think? Um, in the final edit layer, I am, at least ostensibly, theoretically, I'm creating a lot of hard edges. The final edit is not a scumbling layer. It's a putting down strokes and leaving them kind of layer. So that is true. Generally speaking, what I'm doing in this phase is hard edge marks. Therefore, what? Alarm bells should be going off, like danger, 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 Will Robinson, <laughs> to show my age. Kelsey, do, what, do you know what danger, Will Robinson comes from? You know, I'm familiar with the expression, but I don't actually know 
<laughs> okay, you've heard it. You have heard it, though, right? <laughs> okay, it's from this really stupid television program from the 60s and early 70s called Lost in Space. Lost in Space. And the, they had a really bad robot that <laughs> waved its arms. It was a man dressed in a tin can. Will Robinson was a 13-year-old boy. And the computer, I mean, the robot would wave his arms and say, danger, danger, Will Robinson. So that became an expression. All right, so back to, uh, I just had to check with my local millennial sitting behind me <laughs> to see how much of a boomer I was being. Um, so I, when we're doing uh, the final edit layer, we are in fact creating hard edges. Danger, Will Robinson. Because it's way, 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 way easy for painting to have too many hard edges. Nearly impossible for painting to have too many soft edges. All right, so what do you do about that? Number one is I have to be careful. Like I just did all the, everything I've done well, all the way up to the red. All of this is, uh, as I've infused a lot of hard edges into that whole area. What does that mean? That means I better not carry on this process over much of the painting or I'm dead. Right? That, that's one thing that it means. Another thing that it means is <laughs> there's nothing from pre preventing me from coming into everything that I've just so carefully rendered, too carefully rendered as a matter of fact, right? Even right through that flag. Whoa. Soften up a bunch of that stuff. Get it? So I've got just, no, I don't have any Gamsol on the rag. It's just a much used dirty painting rag, but I didn't, so that's how dry it is. All right, so I've just, safeguard number two. When safeguard one is don't continue this over too much area. Safeguard number two is smudge stuff. Safeguard number three is let's define, let's define hard edges. So again, technically speaking, Right in here, I've created hard edges. But the hardness of an edge is defined not only by the sharpness of it, like the, the razor's edge, you know, the line, the line between two colors. Sharpness is also determined by the contrast, how the difference of color between those two areas. And these are very close in color, even though there's lots of hard edges, it's edges between colors that are almost identical. That makes them not very hard edges. <laughs> are you with me? So I'm sort of saying, yeah, but these are pretty soft edges for being hard edges. <laughs> I've just lost half of you. Sorry about that. But that's what, and then of course, number three, safeguard number three is painting ain't done yet. So if, if after all of this, I stand back and go, whoops, <laughs> which ask me if that's ever happened. <laughs> of course, then then I'm not done with the painting. Then I can come in and do, again, all kinds of things, a little bit of scumbling, which then is a problem because after scumbling, you have to come back and anti-scumble, clean up your scumbling, and so on. But the, 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 base, the, the point is the painting's not done um, until it's done. And until it's done, it's not done. That's a, forgive me, that's the way I like to say it, okay? But safeguard number one, safeguard number one is the most important. Um, I cannot carry this this whole process that I've been doing for the last 45 minutes or whatever it's been. I, I need to be careful, and this is my weakness. It's my danger because to me, to me, all of this is so much visual fun. Um, I can get easily me myself, Dan Nelson. I can easily get carried away because I just find it so visually fascinating. So that's I need to watch out for that. Here I am. As, even as we speak, I'm doing more hard edges right down there. <sighs> let me, let me, okay, before I end this broadcast, let's, let's move to a new section of the painting that I have not touched this morning. That's this whole side of this building. Hello, David. Yep, thank you, David, for that. Yep, pink and green to compliment. Yep, yep. <laughs> Matt. <laughs> uh, 
Um, uh, <laughs> no, I don't think I've forgotten to back my camera much yet, David. I think I think I've been remembering pretty much. Okay, let's let's. I'm not going to paint this whole area. That would take maybe too long, but. This is sort of like a virgin territory right here. And again, let me show you the let me show you the the photograph. It's this area right here. And in the photograph, it's virtually all tree. In my painting, it's a lot of tree, but not all tree. Okay? And as you can see, in the grand scheme of things, here's the whole painting. This is pretty far off center, right? I've just, I've just infused this area right here. I'll do more over here, but I just did quite a bit of energy, blue, pink, brown, green, and then the flag. That's what I've just done in this broadcast, blue, pink, brown, and green, and the flag. So quite a bit of energy in there because it's, it's in the energetic part of our painting. My last broadcast, I was calling this a trans shape, this shaft, or maybe it's, it's a little skinny here. It's like this hourglass shape is a trans shape. It's all light that goes across sky, building, building, flag, umbrella, cars, and street. Okay, um, But this here is getting pretty far off the edge, so I not really need to be careful now not to do too much. So let's tackle that just to let you see, again, the final edit layer, and this, again, let me repeat what I said at the beginning. This is, in fact, the the aspect of from for people who are trying trying to do a Dan Nelson painting yeah. this is the part they mess up is the final edit layer because I think most of the time it's because most of my students are intermediate painters they have painted before so when we get to this phase they go oh thank god now I can just paint because I know how to paint this part and they proceed to paint the way they paint and that what I'm trying to indicate here today is no don't <laughs> forgive me don't paint the way you paint if you want to paint like me all right so I've mixed up a pretty dark green but I can see from that right there here let me zoom in I can see from that those marks that I just put down it's not quite dark enough I don't need to take that off although of course I could I'm not going to take it off I'm not going to erase but I can I can run a, a finger through it all right um, so I'm going to mix up some, let me say I need to add brown to it, and ultramarine blue, okay? Brown. That's not an artist term, is it? Oxide red and ultramarine blue. But don't go taking notes. Don't, don't anybody say, oh, 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 write that down. I'll, I'll, no, 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 no. I, I, I'm, not a, I'm not a fan of students um, writing down their, their teachers, normally, their teachers paint recipes because that you need to think with your eyes not with your notebook even even that's a little bit too light so I want to, this to look like a tree in front of a building I'm gonna put this green these green brushes aside for a minute and pick up some other brushes. I'll go back to those to that green in a minute. But uh, let let's let's shift to the brown building here. Um, I'm trying to make up mix up a this color brown which indicates brick building behind the tree right so i'm trying to match that color in an opaque form is this these colors this brown can you see it in there yeah these these browns are made up of layers and layers and layers of color oh, i don't even know what how many layers it doesn't matter um it's a conglomerate conglomerate <laughs> conglomeration of uh, earlier layers, but now I'm trying to match it in in one layer in a single opaque color. Now let's see how, let's see where I'm at. Forgive the grammar. Okay, not bad. And it always needs to be slightly lighter than what's already there. Never slightly darker. Slight even slightly darker will look like mud. Okay, it's 
always need to be slightly lighter, otherwise you've got mud. And as I've said often before, there are many definitions of what is mud. I'm even willing to consider the fact that in different regions of the world, different teachers call different things mud. That's very possible. I don't care about any of the other definitions, not because they're wrong, uh, but simply because, <laughs> I was going to say they're stupid, but that's what I mean is they're easily avoided. Like some people say, oh no, that's not, mud is when you paint too many layers of wet oil paint on top of each other and all the paint gets muddy. Well, I can, yep, that's true, That I can see that that's a good definition of mud. But the antidote, the solution to that is stupid. The answer is, well, don't do that. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't know. Maybe maybe I'm missing something, but that's just like, so yeah, so don't do that. Um, forgive my momentary arrogance. The, the, my definition of mud, which is a misuse, misapplication of opacity, that's, that's, that's mysterious mud. That's, that's the mud that is, I don't know what's wrong with this color right here, but something's wrong with it. It doesn't look right. It looks muddy and I can't figure out why. That's the kind I care about because that's the kind that's confusing. That's the, literally, you can't figure out what's wrong with this part of your painting. Okay, and, and what it is, is you put an opaque, uh, a, a dark opaque on top of something lighter. Okay. Sorry for that little re highly repeated, off-repeated rant, but there it is. <laughs> If you want to see, I have a video just back out to Dan Nelson to my channel and to do a search for mud. Dan Nelson Mud will give you my 11 minute video demonstrating and I think describing it quite well. Okay, this is pretty. That's really pretty. It's also dangerous. I'm, I'm skating very close to the edge of too much, um, too much detail this close to the edge of the painting. I just added some violet purple to my brown, so it's a lovely violet purple color. Is it because I saw a hint of purple in there? That's what prompted that. Again, in the final edit layer, I spend a lot of time and energy matching what's already there. All right, let me pause there just for a minute. Yeah, again, so I've, I've painted this area, this little arrowhead shape right here, and while I've been talking the last 20 minutes, if I continue that here or here or here, it'll be too much of a good thing, okay? I like it, and it's pretty, and it's subtle. The, the, the fact that the colors are so dark and close to each other, the values are close, I might be able to get away with this much, this many hard edges, but just to help diminish that a little bit, I'm going to go ahead and diminish some of that. There, that's better. That is better. <laughs> All right, y'all. Meet my meet some of my family. Oh, they all know Lake. <laughs> that's Cameron. That's Kelsey. That's Lake and Dolly and my daughter Alicia. Is everybody in there? Oh, not quite. Cameron's not in there. Sorry, Cameron. There's Cameron. He was really feeling left out. <laughs> Thanks, gang. <laughs> um, I don't. Well, I eat. Nothing. I don't want anything to eat. Um, okay, back to back to painting here. Um, I'm thinking, I'm thinking, 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 and I think if I just mix up some dark green to match some of that. Um, that I can do just a little bit of final edit layer in there and I'll be done.
I've, I've said often, there's a very, very fine line, and it's hard to find this line. It's a very fine line between um, letting a painting go abstract at the edges, which is a good thing, very fine line between that and a painting that just looks unfinished, like the artist just got lazy and quit and tired and said, ah, good enough. So you don't want the viewer to feel like, well, he just quit. He just didn't finish. So the, what remedies that, that uh, unfinished look? <laughs> oh, sure. One of the, a sandwich with cheese and turkey on it. Thanks. <laughs> All right, so I'm trying to mix up a dark green, dark dull green. Uh, a little more blue in it. I love it if I put a stroke down and you literally can't, and I literally can't see the stroke. I, I love it when that happens. That means I've, I've matched it perfectly. And then typically I just add, need to add a tiny, tiny bit of white to what's on my brushes, tiny bit, to make it slightly lighter and then all is well. So again, just a little bit of, what make, will make this feel finished is just a few, very few, hard edges that will that will take care of it that will convince our brain that we didn't just walk away that we actually finished the painting all the way to the edge does that make sense by the way there's can you see I don't know if you can whoops uh, um, I've got I made these scratch marks a while ago with the handle of the brush, and I like them. I like the abstract, but it's just too much of a good thing, so I'm gonna wipe out some of that. <laughs> Am I standing right in front of you? David making wisecracks about my gray hair. I wish I had more gray hair, to tell you the truth. Yuck, yuck. As opposed to no hair. <laughs> I'll take gray hair any day. But the Lord doesn't give us that choice now, does he? <laughs> okay, I'm mixing up a dirty bluish green to do some sky up here. That's way too intense. Let's add some color killer to it, which, as you know, is raw umber, student grade raw umber. All right. Good. Oh, I matched that just about perfectly. That's happy. Here's a neat little trick I learned years ago doing uh, my cityscapes that you can suggest the edge of a building on the far, through foliage on the other side of a tree by just doing your sky holes, so to speak, in a line. So now it looks like tree in front in front of building, pretty much, doesn't it? Real simple. So I didn't paint the building here at all. I just painted the the, the blue green light up to a consistent edge. And that creates the illusion of a of the uh, tr of the building s standing behind that tree. Again, whenever possible, whenever you can in a painting, don't paint the object. Negative paint, paint around or behind the object, and that's because because our eyes get a kick out of that little momentary flutter of confusion. That is created. Help! My ultramarine is running, running in my pile of ultramarine. 
is running into my pile of phthalo. Boy, that would be a mess. Get those two confused or mixed up. That would not be a happy moment. All right, hang on. I'm nearly finished. Let's we're nearly finished with this corner of the painting, at least until I come back. It's okay, same thing, the edge of this building. I'm going to define the edge of this building not by painting the building, but in fact by painting the sky. So all you have to do is make sure that these blue sky holes stop at a hard edge. Does that make sense? So we, then it conveys the, the impression, gives the impression of a building behind that tree. Be very careful once again. Um, I, I can't be putting too much energy up here. I don't want people's eyes uh, going up to the far left corner of my painting and getting stuck there. Okay? I want them to glance up here and then happily go back to the more focal points of the painting. Ah. Okay, quiz time. Do I want, this just dawns on me as I'm doing this up here, do I want this part of the painting to, to A, look more like, look more like um, a tree with sky behind it, or a tree in front of the sky? Do I want it to look more like a tree with sky behind it, or do I want it to look more like brush strokes? What's the correct answer to that question? Do I want it to look more like a tree with sky behind it, or do I want it to look more like brush strokes? You, you regulars, you know the answer to that question. It is B. I want it to look more like brush strokes. That, oh, accidentally, would you look at that? It looks like a tree with sky behind it. I'm, I'm, uh, let me step back and see if I've accomplished that. Yeah, good enough for now. Yep. All right, so I'm going to stop there. I've been rambling on long enough. Um, thanks, baby. Thanks. Once again, um, this painting has entirely too much opacity because of that scumble layer. There's way too much opaque, but no problem, easy fix. That just means this painting is certainly going to get a layer or two of glazes on top of this. And then after glazing, again, I'll do a little bit of opaque. All right? But that's not the point of this broadcast. The point of this was to try to lead you step by step to some degree, at some, into some depth on the, the concept of final edit layer. All right? Hope that helped. Thanks for your chats, you guys talking to each other mostly, and that's just wonderful. Yes, I am on holiday. I'm in uh, 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 Wrightsville Beach, North Carolina. <laughs> and one of my regulars is saying, the reason I'm not ranting so much is because you guys are all here. Now hang up now and ran away. <laughs> Thanks for watching. Bye.